Hello, listeners. Great to have you around. You look fantastic. That shirt really suits you. I love what you've done to your hair. Have you lost weight or is that just a wasting disease? Either way, you look really, really good. We are, of course, being rhetorical. We can't see you. But we do like to imagine that you are with us now, huddling around our own campfire on Scab Island Beach. This is a new type of Mix and Mojo podcast. Something warm and cosy and conversational. We like to call it the Mix and Mojo Campfire. We're shooting the shit and telling yarns. My name is Gabriel. I'm joined with Dan. Hello, I'm Dan. And of course, Roger. Hello. And we're very excited because we've got a special guest uh, joining us through our live satellite uplink. It is Mr. Paul Franzen. Hello, everyone. And uh, Paul Franzen was convicted in 2003 for five accounts of sexual assault and attempted murder. He is currently serving a jail sent. Oh, sorry, hang on. No, sorry, this is the wrong bite. That's not you, is it? Um, yeah. <laughs> that just came up when I Googled you. That's not. Sorry, hang on. Um, Paul Franzen is SR Systems Energy Engineering Manager oh, at Novellus well, Systems. Well, no, That's you're, you. you're you're getting warmer, I think, but you're you're not, uh, you're not quite editor there. Editor in chief of Game Cola. Yes. That's the one. That's that's the one. That's okay, the one. you're you're third down on the Google listings. Then <laughs> you need to yeah. you need to get up there. Beat Mr. Paul Franzen, who's um, currently serving a nine-year jail sentence. I, I could have sworn I was better than that guy. I know there's a there's a stockbroker who's been just completely ruining my Google alerts for for years. <laughs> right. He is. You see, Paul Franzen. There's a lot of Paul Franzens out there, and Franzons and Franzans and things like that. But I think we're talking to the right one. So you're from Game Cola, and you've, which is a, a wonderful website about um, sort of non-mainstream gaming. Is that right? Yeah, it is. It's you know retro games, little weird indie games. Uh, you know, occasionally the off-color dating sim stuff like that. <laughs> kind of the games that a lot of other sites don't cover. We try to cover them. It's a bit like Mix and Mojo, but more popular. <laughs> and broad. Is it? <laughs> I don't. I don't know if that's necessarily true. <laughs> okay, well, there was a there was a long awkward silence after I said that, so I, I'm assuming that that silence was confirmation. You were nodding. We should point out that, that Paul's um, currently in a blizzard, so yeah. he may well cut out at some point. Yeah, it's it's, it's true. Yeah. We get a little bit on edge every time there's dead air. <laughs> <laughs> we're not quite sure if he's still alive. Actually, every time we 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 refer to him, we we did we did uh, spend uh, approximately half a day just trying to dig out our cars, and we've we've almost unearthed the first tire, so we're getting there. Um, but don't worry, my my wife is out doing uh, the rest of it now while I'm here on the podcast with you. So this is nice priorities in the correct order. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I said nope. Sorry, I have a prior engagement. This is very important. Mix and Mojo cannot continue without me. So I, I'm sorry. Absolutely right. Uh, let's talk about the news really quickly. Um, what's ev- been happening in the world? Uh, there's uh, Talarium, uh or Andrew, as he, his real name is. Uh, is a Telltale Games programmer uh, who has been making a, a sort of how would you describe it, Dan? A sort of a, a robot. Are you um, talking about the the code for thing. the website or his his project that he's doing in his spare time? Yeah, because he's he has built some robots that I've got to be honest are the most terrifying things I've ever seen in my life. But then oh, you know he's he managed to build them. I don't even know how he does these things, but it's very impressive. And according to Twitter, um, he's being he's being sort of um, courted by Fox News to try and get them to try and get them on the on the Fox News channel. I think they're gonna. I don't, he didn't elaborate, so I can only presume they're gonna use them to front a new news program. They're gonna be the presenters. <laughs> That'd be great. I'd like to see that. Mm. Uh, and the cave has come out. I mean, that came out a while ago, but it's coming out uh, on the, on the Linux. And and probably the the Oyu or however you say that. Oh yeah. Did you hear about this? Is that the cave that's coming out on Ouya? Uh yeah, Double Fine announced that, and and also their their adventure game is coming out on that. Yeah, because I heard that, and then it occurred to me that as Ouya is effectively just an Android operating system, does that mean that those games will work on cell phones? Uh, I, I presumably there'd have to be some kind of hacking magic involved, like the scum VM guys. Yeah. But it, if it's the same operating system, maybe. Well, hacking magic is uh, Roger's middle name, isn't it? So, what do you think about that, Roger? Um, probably not. Oh. Um, uh, it's a di- different different uh. hardware from the cell phones. 
so it's the same operating right, system. Right, that's but, true. Isn't but it? I, I got to think they'd be crazy if they're not releasing Double Fine Adventure at least on iOS anyway. I mean, that's yeah. that's where half the indie game, like like everything Telltale makes right now, for example, is coming out on iOS also. So, I, I think yeah, it, that's an interesting point. So maybe Ouya will become this sort of default Android platform that developers can support because it will have the same hardware, won't it? Yeah. Mm. Unlike all the different, you know, Samsung and all these different phones that have completely different hardware, so companies like Telltale, Double Fine just kind of avoid avoid that whole market, don't they? Yeah, and speaking of development and things, uh, we should say that Rod, uh, that Paul is also a games developer himself, uh, albeit an indie one. Although that's that's no belittling thing. That's that's very impressive, and you know, arguably a lot of the the most exciting stuff is uh, in the adventure game genre is happening in the the indie scene. Mm. Uh, so, can you tell us about your game a bit, yeah. um, Paul? It's, it, it was released a while ago now. Yeah, it was a, a few months ago. It's a little indie adventure game for Xbox Live Indie Games, which uh, basically means it's a really kind of a pain to find on the Xbox Marketplace, but it's there, I promise. Uh, it's called Life in the Dorms. <laughs> I was the writer uh, and designer of this game, uh, which essentially means that I wrote everything in a Word document and then sent it to the programmer to actually magically turn it into a video game. Um, that it's a game about uh, college life, basically moving into the dorms after being a high school. And like this, this particular game, it stars a, a guy named Dak Peoples, who uh, kind of he kind of he kind of feels like the best years of his life are behind him already. Like he uh, had a really great high school experience. All of, he made the best friends he's ever had there, uh, and now he is leaving all of them to go to the strange new world where he doesn't know anyone. His RA is uh, exceptionally affectionate. His roommate is extremely creepy and carries a, an axe around with him. Uh, and it's basically a game about solving the various trials and tribulations that he faces, uh, including but not limited to uh, having to perform surgery on one of his roommate's mothers. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds great. Um, and it's got four out of five stars on this website I'm looking at. So, that, so we're talking creme de la creme here. And it's had 157 reviews on that yeah, I mean, it's, it's doing a lot better than we actually anticipated. Um, I don't know if I should be, if I should be sharing, say, uh, sharing sales figures, but we sold over 3,000 copies of it. That's which, brilliant. Uh, wow. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty stoked that over 3,000 people have played a video game that I made. Like, yeah. I, I think that's kind of cool. And so. paid money for us, right? Yeah, I think it's outsold the dig, actually. That's pretty good, <laughs> pretty good numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's pretty good for, uh, specifically for Xbox Live Indie Games, where <laughs> you're kind of happy if you, you know, make enough money to pay for the Xbox membership. And I imagine that after mentioning it on this podcast, the sales are going to go even higher, right? I, that's, that's, that's pretty much the entire reason I'm here, actually. Yeah, you're prepared for billions, potentially billions, because we're, that, yes. that is our audience, because this is going on the, the World Wide Web, which is used by... Pretty much everybody these days. Uh, yeah. I mean, we're all on it. We're all linked up online. Got got our email uh, and everything. So um, that that's good. Uh, and uh, do be prepared for your phone to literally never stop ringing after this podcast goes out. I'm I'm looking forward to it. This is gonna be great. That can happen sometimes for the the wrong reasons as well because we have had a few crank callers after some of these podcasts. But you know, you you sort of. Forget about the crank callers. You'll get some good calls as well. And uh, if any listeners have played the game and want to share their views, uh, please do email in. Uh, and uh, only if they're good views. Yeah. I don't. I don't really. I don't want them to email and say they didn't like it. That's true. Yeah. Email. Email. Podcast at mixamoto dot com. Email. I said email. P-O-D-C-A-S-T at M-I-X-N-M-O-J-O dot com You can also tweet us at uh, Twitter uh, dot mixandmojo dot com. Is that the address? That's not the address. <laughs> it? No, it's, it's just at mixandmojo, I yeah, think. There, there were a few too many dots in there, yeah. but I think you were close. Bit, yeah. Dot crazy. Yeah. Uh, the people who know how to use Twitter know how to find anything on Twitter, That's true. I guess. You don't even need to say Twitter anymore. You can just say uh, dot, and and people will know what to do. They'll they'll search for it on the Google. Uh, so anyway, we're going to be talking about indie games this uh, this week, this month. That's mm. our hot topic. Uh, and if you've got any views, do get in touch with us, listeners. Uh, 
so I, as I was saying, the indie game scene is pretty happening and hip, uh, as well as contributing to the indie adventure game scene. Do you, have you played indie adventure games, Paul? Uh, I've pretty much. That's pretty much all I've played. That's that's that's. <laughs> I I mean, obviously, I'm a fan of Mix and Mojo, so that means I'm a fan of adventure games in general. Mm-hmm. But uh, the last few years, in particular, I've seen a lot of really really great indie adventure games come out. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever played any games by a company called Datalik Entertainment. I haven't. Uh, I haven't heard of them. Actually. You have. Oh, oh, you're missing out. They just released a couple of games called uh, Deponia, and then the sequel, Chaos and Deponia. And and I don't say this lightly. I would put them on the same pedestal as your Monkey Islands in Days of the Tentacles. Oh, okay. Really? I'm gonna have to check this I would, out. I mean, it is, it is, Deponia is the best adventure game that I have played since since the uh, since the fall of Lucas Arts. Wow. Before the flood. I have. I, I don't know if these technically are indie or not, but they're the games that came out by the Wadjet Eye games. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. those are indie. indie. Yeah, Dave Gilbert. Resonance, I thought was I really enjoyed it. I was I didn't expect it to be as sort of um, enjoyable as it was because at first I thought oh it's it's sort of going it's trying to look retro, but there may not actually be anything uh, you know deeper than that. But it was actually quite an interesting sort of spin on the on the the old style adventure games where you know playing around with different characters and not really knowing the full picture and it was it was you know something that i think could only really have come out of an independent sort of mindset really because it was trying something that was different i i kind of find wadjet eyes games refreshing in a way because so many of the adventure games right now like they try so hard to be comedic life in the dorms included and like these ones don't. They have a very. They have a much more serious, almost somber tone to them. Yeah, and it's, that's right. It's, yeah, it's cool because I, I, I. This might be a little too far off topic, but I feel like the adventure game genre is is getting very homogenized now. Like basically everything is influenced by the Lucas Arts games. That you don't really see any kind of Sierra style games anymore, where it's it's much more about the plot than it is about the jokes. And I feel like Wadjet Eye is is very good about that. Hmm. Would you say that's true about Telltale's latest games? I mean, what about The Walking Dead, for instance? That's 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 a fair point. The Walking Dead does not have any jokes in it, mm. and that and that has been said to be you know one of their best. I mean, much better than uh, some yeah. of their recent efforts. Uh, well, of course. I mean, they had a former Mix and Mojo working on it, so. Oh sure, was it, was that was that the crazy robot man? Yes. Ah, okay. <laughs> no, it was, it was uh, Jake Rodkin. Oh, and him. Hey, didn't he win yes. an award or something? You I know believe about this, he did, Dan. yeah. Him didn't... and uh, Sean Vanneman, I think. Was he the other writer? That's right, uh, yeah. I mean, they, they won all of the awards from everything for that game, essentially. Like, I don't know if, if you guys were following uh, year-end awards for various websites this year. It, if it didn't go to Walking Dead, it went to Journey. Like, they, those, that was it. Yeah. That was it this year. They really did. Um, everyone on the internet loved that game, and it's a very... For for a serious adventure game, it does get into sort of territory where you a, a lot of the purists, especially people who were playing adventure games in the seventies, will probably hate it because there's no puzzles in the strictest sense or anything that you would right. normally associate with the game. But it is a, an adventure game, and it is clearly not a comedic adventure game. And it's I think it's you know very well told That's story. That's uh, certainly my in my opinion, Telltale's best game but i mean that would that would be my other complaint about the homogenization of adventure games now is that uh the other thing that we've kind of lost is the ability to die that you saw uh in sierra games and obviously you can do that in the walking dead in and quite a number of ways Mm, but that's true yeah do you think that um maybe a reason why indie games uh are tend to be more serious and darker is because the lives of the developers are (laughs) more grim (laughs) More serious because you know they're often living out of cardboard boxes on the streets, um, so sort of programming on, I I don't know like Spectrum SX four hundreds and things so like that. You're saying they're more like the starving artist than this sort of exactly. guy who goes to work and gets his paycheck and makes makes the game. Yeah, because that guy is happy whatever happens. I mean, obviously they they work hard and they want to make a good game, but they they you know there's an inner j- uh, jollity. Uh, I mean, look at Dave Grossman; he's always writing poetry. Mm. For instance, uh, that that doesn't strike me as the man, as, as the the work of a man who uh, needs to who do, who doesn't know where his next uh, piece of pudding is coming from. 
Although a lot of poets will pretend to be like that. I don't think they really, you know, poetry is something you do for leisure, isn't it? And, and maybe, maybe jokes is the same. Sometimes it can be a purely angsty experience. It can be the, the direct opposite as well. But I don't think Dave Grossman's suffering from a, like a sort of terrible depression or anything. <laughs> well, we don't know, actually. That's, it could be quite serious. If you're listening, Dave, uh, and you want to talk to anyone, um, please do get in touch. Uh, we, we can be a counselling service as well as uh, a podcast. Uh, but um, would, would those be at the same time? Would we stream this on the internet? Well, well if, they, if they sign the waiver, then there's actually yeah. no reason why we couldn't turn it into a very lucrative. Because I, I kind of feel like there's there's a spin-off podcast in there somewhere. That's a good idea, uh, <laughs> but I, you know, maybe it's also a budget thing because uh, indie developers don't have any money, so they can't afford jokes because it's quite it's quite hard to write funny lines as well so and and often people feel like they need to hire a writer to do that kind of thing that's what um uh there's a a kickstarter for a a dungeon keeper style game war of the overworld and um one of their uh, uh stretch goals was to hire a voice actor richard ridings uh who um who, who did the mental voice in the, the Dungeon Keeper games, and they, they said that they needed a lot of money in order to get him, not just to pay his, his, his wage, but to hire a writer to, to write funny lines to justify getting him to speak <laughs> at all. Um, and and that's, that's the thing always, people always say, is that writing humor is, is one of the hardest things to do. Mm. So I think that's just one of the reasons why so many people, uh, it's not always a big focus. Um, I think what would really be beneficial for anyone who wants to write a comedic game would be to work with a partner or work with multiple people. Yeah. Is I I think um, yeah, just having different experiences, different humor styles. There, you can help maximize the potential of each line in the game. Whereas if you're just doing it yourself, I mean, you run out of stuff eventually. Mm. But I suppose there's also an advantage to uh, indie games uh, in terms of humor because uh, I think Ron Gilbert, or one of the the Monkey Island creators, uh, was saying that it, it was easier back in the days before talkies. Um, to make funny things because you you know you have an idea for a funny joke and then you just program it in um, then and there and you could do that uh, almost at any time in the development cycle whilst um, when you're having voice acted games you have to lock down the script and then you have to send it to the studio and then you have to yeah, record the that's, lines that's true I mean that, that was kind of one of the reasons we left voice acting out of life in the dorms was that uh, we just we did like you said we didn't really want to be locked into that and also uh, I'm I'm just so wary of getting like the voice actors we could have afforded for the game, <laughs> I don't know if that necessarily would have added something to the game or not. Because mm. I I don't know my 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 opinion of voice acting is kind of if it's good it can add to the game but if it's bad it can it can make the game way way more worse you know yeah yeah um, I I think personally speaking I think the talkies lend themselves better to serious games anyway because there's yeah um uh, with something like the first one canon there's a lot of humor that um that was there from reading the dialogue. And then when they actually recorded dialogue for it and did the special edition, the, those jokes weren't so funny anymore. And I noticed with Tales of Monkey Island, um, which was the, the first one that Telltale made, knowing that it was going to be voice, um, that it was more like a sitcom. The You know, the jokes on paper wouldn't have been very funny because it was about the sort of the delivery of them and the timing. And then right. when there were, I think it was Chuck Jordan or someone had written a piece saying that by shifting away from the comedy style and towards something that was more serious with uh, like the, the switch from Tales of Monkey Island to The Walking Dead um, it, suddenly the episodic thing started to work because p- strictly because they weren't trying to be funny with that game and it's it's interesting to think about it in those mm-hmm. terms where you can uh, that's certainly how I've always thought about it anyway is that you whatever your what's available to you is you can use it to your advantage if you see what i mean if you if you don't have voice actors then you make the game knowing that you're you're never going to have the voice actors and turn that into into a positive or something like that anyway yeah Mm. Uh, but i I would say in defense of comedic voice acting uh, i was talking about deponia a little bit um the the lead actor in the game i'm not sure what his name is but he he brought a lot to that role like i was reading the dialogue and listening to it at the same time and uh, it was. I mean, it was, it's kind of an awkward uh, translation. I, I forget um, where they're based. I think it's. It might be Norway. Um, Norway. But well, we've got a Norwegian expert <laughs> on the line. Roger, is this true? Can you confirm this? 
Can you look out of the window and see if you can see this person <laughs> that we're talking about and shout their name? <laughs> but um, <laughs> that, that's kind of a, a criticism of uh, data lakes games in general is that their localizations tend to have issues. And you could kind of see it while you're reading the text. But the voice actor was actually, he was able to elevate it and make each line sound totally natural. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was quite, quite impressive. Speaking of uh, sort of voice acting that's a bit distracting, um, Roger, you played uh, those cop games, right? Didn't you say that it was a bit distracting? What were they called? Dirty Dan and the Dodgems? What, what was it? Harry? Ha <laughs> Horrid Dan. Harry? I don't know. It was something like that. You know the ones I mean. You, you know the ones that were... It was oh, the, reviewed the on Mixed Mojo. Hector something. Hector. Yeah, Hector, Hector Badge of ju Justice. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's what you're talking I, re I remember those. Um, I reviewed... I'm sorry, wait, did you say Dirty Dan? Something like that, I don't know. <laughs> I was thinking of uh, uh, the notorious Peter. No, granted, file. that's actually a fairly accurate description of the main character, but <laughs> I haven't played those games. You see, it wasn't wasn't it all played by four like the same voice actor, even the woman? Yeah, it was the same guy who did uh, all the voices for the first game, including the uh, women. And, was um, was that okay? Uh, it, it was noticeable. Mm -hmm. It is the same guy. I mean, he, he did a good job on on the males, but on the females, it kind of felt like someone was just fucking around not really <coughs> taking the material seriously yeah <laughs> and and you and even though it is comedic you you, you need the actors to take the lines s seriously and perform yeah. them well yeah mm -hmm. although um it worked very well for discworld noir D has anyone played that Actually, yeah, that was the one with Rob Brydon in, wasn't it? It does. A, it does a lot of dialogue, and yeah, it has a lot of dialogue, and and very few voice actors. Um, maybe the listeners have played it as well. Uh, one of the voice actors is as Rob Brydon, who's 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 brilliant at lots of different voices. Um, although he said it was hell to um, to do uh, because you have to say every line in about a hundred different ways, um, and especially in in that game because it's it was based on Terry Pratchett, who's pretty um, verbose. It was far too noir in my experience because I couldn't see a thing. It was it was literally noir. <laughs> That's true. It's it was one of those games, wasn't it? Um, although um, th there's a lot of uh, going back to the indie games. Um, I, the games I want to play, which I, I I feel bad for not playing these yet, but they're all sort of on my list. I, I guess everyone has that you know a list of games that they want to, to get around to playing, and someday they will do. But um, we were talking about Wadget Eye um, and um, the games with the ghost and the uh, oh the the Blackwell games. Yeah, those look really good. Yeah, have you, yeah. Has anyone played those? Yeah, I played the first one um, when it came out. Um, my memory's a little foggy on it, but I do remember mm. I enjoyed it quite a bit. For some reason, I'm Facebook friends with the guy who does those. I don't know why. I think he. I don't know if. He, I think he must have added me. Uh, There's something else you've forgotten. Did you work on those games? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I remem remember coming across Dave Gilbert because he said uh, that his he was a product of Dave Grossman and Ron Gilbert coming together and <laughs> forming um, a single mass. But I was also fascinated by his story because he started out. Um, if, if memory serves, it, it seems like he sort of quit his job one day. I, I don't know if it, that he actually did that. But he anyway, he ended up just going to Starbucks um, every day uh, and working like a nine to five in, in, I think it was specifically Starbucks. They probably part funded his game. But um, anyway, any coffee shop uh, would do. And uh, he just sort of treated it as a, as a working job uh, and then turned it into his, his single thing um, that he was doing. But that's that's not your experience, though, is it, Paul? You, you you've sort of done this on the side. No, yeah, I mean, I, I have a full time nine to five job, and then in evenings and weekends, I try to work on game development. I mean, that's how I did life in the dorms. And I have another game I'm working on right now too. Uh, same idea. It is like a wholesale thing, wouldn't it? You, if you if you were going to sort of quit your job and say that I'm going to do this, you would have to really really put everything into it. I suppose yeah. there's no option to to not succeed. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I feel like, but my long term, that's kind of what I do want to do. Um, hmm. But I extremely nervous of the idea right now, uh, and I kind of like my job, so I don't want to just give it up entirely and work on game development, and then you know, have a game not sell well, and oh, that's it. Now I'm in a cardboard box. That yeah. stinks. But you like you write the game, don't you? And I'm not sure that does Dave Gilbert actually do that? It does because all the games that, that I've played by Wadget, I have been sort of specifically written by someone else. And I, I, the impression I got was more that they were like a production facility for people who, who were trying to make a game that they wouldn't be able to do by themselves. That's true. I mean, he, I think 
well, I feel like the Blackwell games, I think he might have done those mostly himself, but I oh, think okay. he has a, yeah, I think he has a few others that he's published too, didn't he do like Emerald City Confidential, yep. I think, uh, about Wizard of Oz. Uh, and... Yep. Yes. And there was, there was one with uh, robots in it. The Primordia is the, the new one. Yes. Oh, which looks nice, so I've not played it. But I, I actually am doing a, I actually am coding the game I'm working on right now, which has been uh, a bit of an adventure, using AGS, which is the same program, I believe, that Dave still uses. Yep. Uh, so that's, that's been fun. I've, I've basically just been learning as I'm going. I, I used uh, the Games Factory back in the day, uh, which, which isn't nearly as good as AGS um, for, for adventure <laughs> games. It's pretty right. hard work. Although, um, I mean, this is very retro, but um, I used to love Scurvy Lovers games. I don't know if anyone has played Scurvy Lovers games. He, he was famous for uh, oh. having a Monkey Island fan game that was shut down by LucasArts. <laughs> there were, only two were ever shut down, and one of them was The Fate of Monkey Island. I just realized those cease and desists are going to be like collector's items now. Yeah. <laughs> Disney's lawyers aren't going to be too bothered about that stuff. Anyone who's got a cease and desist from Lucas Legal should frame that thing if they haven't already. Yeah, because they've even you know, they've changed the logos as well, so you don't get that that exact letter anymore. That's oh, true. You see. They, they're really hard to come by. Of course, in the 90s, all you had to do was set up a website, and then they send you one within a few hours, but <laughs> there's yeah. no one's going to have any anymore. I once got a cease and desist from a Canadian folk singer. Ooh, that's good. <laughs> I, it was like I was on vacation with my parents, and I bought this guy's CD, and I, and I wrote a little article for it on my uh, free yellow website, and I used a picture of him that he, he did not like that I used a picture of him, so oh, he told wow. me to take it down. <laughs> I'm like 13 years old, and I'm getting a cease and desist letter from Stompin' Tom Connors. It was... Oh, dear, dear. Uh, sings a song about ketchup. Uh, and what what do you do for a crust, if you don't mind me asking, Paul, if that's a weird way of expressing that question? What do you uh, do for, for a what? living? A crust, I said. Is that a phrase? What do you a do crust? for a crust? Like a crust of bread? I don't know. What do you do for a living? <laughs> okay. So I guess <laughs> that's uh, a phrase. I don't know if that, that phrase translates into American. <laughs> well, you have bread, don't you? Sorry. Um, have... I'm a cop. I'm a copy oh. editor. I actually I work from home full time with a with a firm based in New Jersey. Uh, I live in Connecticut. Um, working for a company that uh, does personality assessments for other companies, uh, for people who are applying for jobs there. So that's oh, quite no. interesting that you, you work from home 9 to 5, and then you work on yeah. game I, I essentially stuff. work from home 9 to yeah. 9, really. Does that, does that make you go <laughs> Take crazy? Take breaks for meals occasionally. but <laughs> You're okay with that? That's all right? Is uh, this... I mean, it works out. It, I, I love working from home. I, I never want to go back. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think I would enjoy that too. Yeah. I, I, I don't think I would actually have the, the sort of... I wouldn't be able to do it. I, I'd just pretend to be doing it. I'd get up at sort of midday and so <laughs> You know, I'd, I'd do the work eventually, but I'd be up all night, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I, I can't do that. It would, it would never work. But I like the idea of it. Yeah, I mean, it's nice. I, I started off on-site, but then uh, my wife um, got accepted to graduate school in Connecticut, so we moved, and they said I could keep working uh, full-time from my home. And it's actually a lot better for me because I'm so easily distracted if anyone's talking anywhere near me and uh if i recall correctly my cubicle was seated near the sales department <laughs> so that, that presented a few problems for me right so i mean i i, I my uh, productivity actually shot up uh, as soon as i started working from my home office so big fan of it personally yeah i was very interested um in the double fine adventure documentary and if you haven't uh Listeners, if you haven't uh, got access to this, I think you you can get access to it uh, after the event by uh, paying through PayPal. It's really cracking uh, documentary. Have have uh, you all seen it? Um, I watched the first two episodes and then I I got to a point where I decided I was just going to wait until they shipped me the DVD and I was just going to sit down yeah. and watch all of it in one in one go. Actually, that would be a good idea as well. Oh, there were some like extra ones. I watched one that was like forty minutes of Tim Schafer playing Day of the Tentacle and sort of <laughs> criticizing himself. <laughs> oh, that sounds awesome! Oh man, I didn't know that was out there. That's cool. I, I've been kind of ignoring them because I'm I'm so terrified of spoilers of the game. Like I haven't read any of the Kickstarter emails since it started. Well, mm. there was um there was an interesting one uh, that had. Uh, Peter Chan in it. That's his name, isn't it? Peter Chan. That's right. Yeah, Peter uh, Chan and from Grimpadang. <laughs> yeah, Peter Pan. Yeah, um, I hadn't thought about that before. That's brilliant. Uh, and uh, it, 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 I, Peter Chan. Everyone knows the name, right? But but no one knew the man. And he's really interesting. He lives on an island, uh, in a forest, a forested island. And he he the the reason I mention him uh, based on what you've been saying, Paul, is is because he works. Um, 
in his sort of wood cabin. Uh, but I think but he, he, yeah, he's not going to fly over to to the mainland every day to go to work, is he? No, no, exactly. I mean, he's an artist, for goodness sake. Uh, yeah, and that sounds, uh, that sounds wonderful. It is wonderful. It's really, really yeah. cool. If, it's well worth looking at the documentary because it's such a, a, a sort of an idyllic sort of island existence. Uh, but I think what he does is he has a slightly separate room for his work. So he sort of he has a little commute, so to speak, which is like a, a, a one minute stroll. Um, yeah. I always think that that would be quite uh, uh, appealing. Yeah, I mean, I pretty much just commute from the bed to the office. That is my commute. Well, at least you do that, because some people don't even do yeah, that. It's true. I mean, I, I even get dressed in the morning, which I would assume a lot of people who work off-site don't bother. So. I'm so jealous of, of mm. Peter Chen and Paul Franzen. Uh, and the logistics of working on uh, a game like Life in the Dorms, uh, you, you had to sort of converse with people from all around the world, didn't you? It's true, yeah. I mean... I, I've been reading a lot on Gama Sutra uh, post-mortems from other people who have tried to do similar things, and they've had a lot of problems with communication, stuff like that, but, I mean, that was not my experience at all with Life in the Dorms. Uh, we never actually, like, we've never, I never met the programmer in person. We never even had so much as a Skype call. We did everything exclusively through email, uh, and I think, it, I mean, it worked out really well, I guess, because we were both working full-time in addition to working on the game. Like, I, I think we might have run into some problems if we were both trying to do this as our jobs and we weren't able to communicate pretty regularly but uh i mean i never had any problem with it at all it was it was kind of ideal for me because i don't really like talking to people that much <laughs> well I, I guess if you're if you're working with one other person that's pretty good yeah. because you have a personal connection with them i mean the, the things that always make me laugh and but also cry at the same time is when the the really enthusiastic people come to get on together on the forums and say okay let's make a fan game it's, uh, let's let's talk about the story, and and you know it's never going to work. Yeah. Well, uh, that's what I was going to say. Is you got really lucky to find a guy who who hasn't sort of got bored with the with the whole thing at oh, some point. Oh, absolutely. Because so many of these projects, they've still got the web page available, or you can see it on archive.org, and they got all these screenshots, this explosion of interest, and then sort yeah. of two months later it's ground to a halt and and it there may be if you're lucky there's a demo that yeah. just suggests that it might have been okay <laughs> and, but everyone just just did, just couldn't find the discipline to keep working on it well that's the thing you you have to avoid the projects where people are are so heavily focused on like coming up with the perfect name or writing a press release or yeah. making concept <laughs> art like you need to you need to find someone who just wants to sit down and start making the game and kind of worry about the dressings later i mean that was what it was like with ted uh, the programmer like we didn't we did not come up with a title for the game until we'd been working on it for about a year so like we didn't we didn't even worry about that cuz we were just focused on figuring out what the story was figuring out who these mm. characters are and figuring out what kind of did very strange things we can make the player do with these characters that's interesting and it it correlates with something that tim schafer said about uh game design and game making i think it was in the first episode of the documentary so you might have seen this when he was saying that publishers would like to, to always want to see like a, a slither of finished product um they they uh, and actually what tim schafer was saying game development is really like is like lots of dots sort of falling from the ceiling in slow motion and and <laughs> you you're trying to arrange the dots um, so that they will, when they hit the paper on the ground, they will sort of make a, a picture and a, 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 of something. And um, the publisher is coming along and saying, okay, can we just have like a line of the dots, see what the dots look like? Or can, we, can you just get all the red ones down? And it's, it's not like that at all. It's, it's, you have to get everything uh, in place at the same moment, like um, making a ship in a bottle, I suppose. And, 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 then, you, and then at the last moment, you, you pull the, 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 um, the, the sails up. Um, but, you know, the, the stuff that, I mean, that's the reality of it, that it's that kind of complex mess that sort of emerges at the end. But what peop some people really like is... is we, didn't, we didn't even bring on, like, a dedicated artist or a dedicated musician until about the same time when we were coming up with a name for it. Like, it, it didn't really look anything like its finished product until six months before it actually was a finished mm -hmm. product, I, I would say. But, uh, I, I don't know if other indie game developers' experiences have been like that, but that's what it was for us. It would be really interesting to hear people's views um, because I'm sure yeah. we have some indie mm. game listeners. Uh, so please do get in touch. Um, I, actually, it, well, you mentioned go on. Oh, so I was going to say. I mean, you we're talking about Tim Schafer, and I know that um, indie is a term that is that has a definition, but if uh, in terms of independent, I mean, that's what mm -hmm. Double Fine Adventure is, and it's. Um, it's it's a sort of it looks like it's a move from an established company to move towards the kind of um, work working style that that Paul has, where there is no publisher kind of 
giving you these ridiculous kind of milestones that are, I mean, they're there, they're designed in order to, to make sure the project ships at a particular date. But what they're doing is saying, well, we'll take the money and we'll work on it how we want to make it. And that is an inherently sort of independent attitude or ethic, I suppose. Yeah. And, and there's been a, like an explosion of well-known games designers sort of going to Kickstarter after after the Double Fine Adventure success. Um, that look, it's effectively it's to me, although they're established studios, they that is an independent model because they're they're getting the money directly, and then the, it's the fans who are. It's the interest, if you see what I mean. It's the same as if if, uh, if some independent guys start making a game and put up a few screenshots and post it on forums, and people get interested, and you say, "I'd, I'd quite like to play this," you know. And so then you, you you say, "When it's available, I'll buy it, guys," you know. And that's that's enough to encourage them to keep working on the game. Mm-hmm. And it, it's like the same model is just slightly reversed, but there's there's still that. It's a it's more about the enthusiasm of what people want and what the the people are trying to make, as opposed to what the mass market wants or yeah and i think for adventure games that can that's got to be a really good thing yeah and i think for small developers as well a a lot of them are working um with people from around the world Uh, i know that um uh autumn moon did a lot of that i'm not quite sure if autumn moon still exists does anyone know what the status is on that i'm wondering about that too actually is are they still working on a new vampire Um, story game he's uh, Bill Tiller is working solo. He's he's been talking about it on Twitter that is it's thinking of doing a uh, a Kickstarter right. for the uh, of Empire Story Year One, which might is as well. Everyone it's else is. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's supposed to be a a prequel to the first game because the sequel okay. is tied up in, with with a publisher. And it's a it's a Frank Miller uh, reference, I suppose, because he did he did the. Uh, he just doesn't have the right to make a Empire Story too for some reason. Right, because he did. Um, f- uh, didn't Frank Miller do uh, Batman Year One or The Dark Knight Year One? I think it was called. So I guess it's a reference to that. Year Zero. No, it was called Year One. I think. I I was thinking of something else. I'm mm. sure. Um, you know what my favorite indie game is? Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's <laughs> it's worth it. This is going to be a really good joke. So you're going to have to say no. I don't. What no. is it? Okay, so get ready, what's your, everyone. What's your favorite indie game? Um. Ah, I'm glad you asked. It's called The Fate of Atlantis. <laughs> uh, <cool>. oh. <laughs> Indiana Jones, Indiana. That, oh, that was good. That was good. Uh, <laughs> um, we should launch into our feature because we, we, we've, uh, we've got a feature. We're, we're like a proper podcast and everything with features and stuff. So um, it's, it's called the eBay uh, game. Here's the jingle. A LucasArts jacket, a Monkey Island magnet, I bought it on eBay. A lock of Gilbert's hair, a programmer's chair, I bought it on eBay. A Duke novelization, a CMI translation, I bought it on eBay. A Star Wars Jedi fighter, a Grim Fandango lighter, I bought it on eBay. And uh, that's the jingle. So uh, it's basically when we look for something ridiculous on eBay that's LucasArts related. And we found something. It is Star Wars Episode One: Battle for Naboo, Nintendo 64, LucasArts new and sealed rare. And it's a beautiful uh, box. I've never seen this game before, actually. Um, but it looks, it's got lasers on it. It's uh, got a, a spaceship. Uh, there's two spaceships. They're firing lasers at each other. They're presumably on Naboo. Um, it says LucasArts Entertain- Entertainment Company presents at the top. And THQ is at the bottom. Uh, and um, this is all presented lovingly uh, on the eBay page. Guess how much it's going for? That's uh, an N64 game. About five dollars. That, that's how much it's yeah. worth, anyway. I mean, they're all mass-produced, aren't they? So yeah. I mean, surely you, you, at the at the most, you you've got to be talking about sort of sixty quid. Well, Paul, you're um, an aficionado of yard sales, I'm told. So what what do you think? What, what, yes. If you saw this in a yard sale. <laughs> Well, okay, so it's it's a. Uh, did you say it's sealed in the box and everything? Yeah. Still shrink wrapped. Uh, shrink wrapped N sixty four game. I would say at least ten dollars. Okay. Well, it's uh, hold <laughs> yeah. on to your hats, uh, people, because it's going for seven hundred ninety one dollars <laughs> seventy eight uh, cents, or um, four hundred ninety nine pounds. Is that is he going for seven hundred ninety one dollars, or is that what he's asking for? That well, there, there's been a like, a bidding war. Yeah. 
So that oh, he's wow. he's asking for a lot, and and it says that there's been one bid, but the offer status has expired. So I don't quite understand what that means. But I'm more fascinated by uh, his uh, his description. Um, he says the game is sealed, and then he puts in capital letters, one of the last games to be released and very hard to find. Um, and I'm intrigued by this idea that it's one of the last games to be released because there have been games released previously. Yeah, that, that's that's kind of burying the lead, isn't it, about the end of the video game industry? Like, who knew? Well, I like to think that maybe he's a time traveler from the year 3000 and he knows that in the future, uh, the, the, you know, we're just about to enter an, into an apocalyptic war and a revolution or something like that. And mm. this is this is one of the last games to be released sort of in the, in the broad, you know, in the last... You, you know how historians sort of uh, do that sort of thing. Well, hold on. I'm trying to think about this. And the N64, maybe he means it's one of the last N64 games. And when did Star Wars Episode One come out? Like, 1999? 99. And the... Um, N64 was like... It, well, it, it's, it's not production of the 64 around that time, around 2000 when the GameCube was released. Right, okay. Okay, so maybe that's what so he, he means. So he actually knew that, that it was probably going to be one of the last games. It wasn't like it was a coincidence. It was mm. like they'd announced the next console, and he and he thought, "Well, I won't, I'm not even going to open this." <laughs> I'm just I'm just picturing this poor person just stockpiling a pile <laughs> of Battle for Naboo for N64. It's like a closet <laughs> full of them shrink draft in. I'm going to retire yeah. on this. This is great. It's going to go up in value. That's what Brian Moriarty's house is like with his Loom stuff that occasionally appears on eBay. <laughs> He's like, "This is this is the real deal, guys. Trust me." <laughs> wink, wink. But no, he was selling some insanely rare Japanese CD that had um, like an orchestral version of the, of the theme and I was thinking but it's Swan Lake you can buy it anywhere <laughs> yeah, there's the, uh, the a st- a string quartet playing the Swan Lake pieces from the game and then they put the Loom logo in front of it um, but are there arrangements in Loom that are different to anything that are in the, the no, actual Swan Lake but it was uh, so, it, they released it as a spin of the game they did, a, they did a Maniac Mansion album as well but I have no idea how that one sounds like wow Nobody knows. I've well, seen the cover, but that's that's it. Yeah, that is the most obscure thing I've ever heard of. An actual like orchestral maniac mansion CD. I don't know if it's orchestral. Probably some synth shit. Uh, but my favorite part of um, the Battle of Naboo uh, eBay description is when he says, "I only speak English, but will do my best to converse in other languages if you like." <laughs> Google Translate is available, so I'll... it's all about confidence, right? And just winging it on the day. Like, if you say you're, <laughs> you're German, you, I could just sort of say Einen, Feinen, Reinen, Deinen. Or, or Norwegian is Organ, Borgen, Forgen, right? Well, how hard could it be? That sounds a bit Norwegian. <laughs> but he says, I speak basic French and, and Welsh, uh, which I'm sure will come in, in handy for all the, the Welsh people who can't speak English. Does it say where he's based on the on the, on the the page? Uh, it doesn't. Oh, no, it does. It does. Oh, he's, he's based in uh, Chester. That's your hometown, isn't it? Pretty much. Chester. Well, Chester's quite close to Wales, actually. So that's, and I know that because I used to work with a guy who was from Wrexham, which is in Wales, and ah, okay. he supported the football club, and they hated Chester, and so they must be really close. So that's that's the eBay. That's the, that's the best eBay thing we found. But uh, if you can find something better on eBay, please let us know, and we'll um, we'll look into it, and possibly buy it. Uh, that would be fun, wouldn't it? I'm going to set up a Kickstarter to buy this. I, there's got to be enough people to chip in to, so that we can get it and, and open it and see. One of the last games it's... ever made. Yeah. See what it's like. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's almost all we've got time for this time. Again, we're not quite sure when we'll be back because um, we had to we had to spend a long time with the Disney uh, lawyers uh, in order to get this far. Um, but I guess there's just enough time to say uh, what we've been doing recently, and I know a lot of people have been playing. Ron Gilbert's uh, new game, the, the game made by mm. the, the ghost of Ron Gilbert, uh, which is called The Cave. Yeah, it's a, it's a good game. Would you recommend it to everyone? Not to everyone. No. I mean, that's crazy. I haven't played it yet, I have to say. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm, I've been replaying the Dungeon Keeper games, because I got inspired by that Dungeon Keeper Kickstarter I was mentioning before. But um, So The Cave would be quite good to go on to after Dungeon Keeper, because they're, they're all kind of... They, they seem quite dark and dingy games, right? Set underground. It's like a sort of a tenuous trilogy there. I, I feel I feel I feel bad. I like I, I who am I to to rip into something Ron Gilbert of all people worked on? But I I did not in, I did not enjoy my experience with the cave. Well, that's interesting. Uh, my wife and I downloaded the demo on Xbox Live, and I just I found it very frustrating, and it was just like 
some some really basic mechanical stuff that was a problem. Like, the game itself seemed really cool, but I couldn't get over the fact that, one, you could only carry one item at a time, and two, uh, there was no kind of split screen or anything that would at least... Yeah, the split screen is a... That's a real pain, because I've been playing it with with someone as well, and, like, it, it's, it's really difficult, because, you know, you're both sort of running along through the platformy sections, and then one person will just get that a little bit further ahead, and it's gonna, it chooses which one of you it's going to stay with. Yeah. And then the, you, you have to ask the other person to stop, don't you, and sort of wait for you. <laughs> I was kind of hoping with the, uh, the Wii U version that maybe one person could play on the little Wii U screen and one person can play on the TV, but I haven't read anything that suggests that's the case. Uh, if anyone listening uh, can shed any light on that, that would be great, because I will absolutely buy the Wii U version. Like, that would, that would be enough to push me over the edge, I think. Like I, I just need that. I can't stand just sitting there waiting for someone else to do something. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it, it would frustrate me more to play it by myself and then have to sort of switch characters and run around, do it all. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot better to have someone else sort of make that journey up at yeah. the same time as you. Well, that's the other thing. If there was a way to, uh, sorry, if there was a way to call the characters to you, like that would, that would also be even if, even if you're playing with someone else. Like, to just call all of the other characters to where your current character is, like, that would, that would also take care of it. The, the inventory thing really was getting to me, though, because I, I just never knew if I was carrying the right item or not, and if I'd have to spend the next five minutes running back to get the right one. And I had yeah. uh, a lot of trouble selecting the item I wanted to do, too. There was a part where I just picked up, like, eight cans of grog in a row while I was trying to get a crowbar <laughs> or something. Like, like, there's just some, like, really, like, kind of surface-level stuff that I, was, I couldn't get past, but the actual underlying game seemed pretty cool. Yeah, the game, I, I've been enjoying it, and I, I read something online, and I can't remember what it was, and I know that it was, it was just, Ron Gilbert said it, and he either said that there were definitely items in the game that were red herrings that did nothing, or he said <laughs> there definitely weren't, and because I didn't know which one it was, I couldn't remember, it was, it was an, a nightmare, because the, fir- the first time I got to the point where there were four items, it was like, well, what am I going to drop? <laughs> it was like playing uh, one of the Dizzy games. In the in the eighties or something. That's what I, I, that was that was what I was thinking too. Yeah. That's classic Ron Gilbert though, because he said the same thing about the secret of Monkey Island that there were jokes that weren't jokes and that would point to the secret <laughs> right. and red, red hangs and so on. So, who knows what he's saying? He, I mean, he the man is is uh, clinically insane. Um, the, actually, I have to say the the whole inventory thing that you mentioned about only being able to carry one item does quite appeal to me. Um, I played this great game back in the day um, called The Lost Frog. Um, and we, you know, we were talking about indie games, uh, indie adventure games. Um, of course, indie adventure games are as old as, um, as old as the hills. Uh, this was back in, um, I don't know, early, early, ooh, late the eighties, I think, on the BBC computer. Uh, and um, I don't know if it was proper indie, but it was released for, uh, in a very limited way, and and it was an adventure game, uh, all text based, um, no pictures or anything. Um, where you had to search a house for a frog and you could only carry one item at a time. Um, and so the puzzles were about how to get to different places um, with the items that you have and which ones not to carry. And I, I thought, always thought that was interesting and I thought there was uh, a bit, bit of a letdown that adventure games didn't do that uh, afterwards. Um, and, you know, they even made it a, a joke in The Curse of Monkey Island when... Um, Guybrush puts that massive rod down his trousers and, and it sort of becomes a parody of itself. Um, but you, you're saying that doesn't work very well? I was going to say something completely different, which was that I played um, the, the first text adventure, the Colossal Cave Adventure, and I obviously didn't complete it. No, wait, sorry, it was another game, it was Zork. And I, it was like, that was obviously way back, probably late 70s, early 80s, all text. And it was like almost that they would, trying to be too realistic because I got to a point where I picked something up and it and the game said to me like as you pick it up you drop something else oh, so I was okay. like well pick pick that back up and then, so you drop something else yeah and it took me about five minutes to realize how stupid I am but it took me about five minutes to realize that it was effectively saying you've got too much stuff you're gonna have to drop something yeah and I was like well what the hell which which stuff and then there was a sword and I it, the sword was too heavy and I dropped everything and then I could pick it up and it it was seemed to me that like since then it it wasn't that they were it was like that they just got sick of it and said let's just have it so you can pick up whatever you want yeah. because this is <laughs> stupid this is really annoying it's, I mean it's it's really it's it's obviously very unrealistic uh, the way most adventure games do it where you can just pick up everything and carry them around your pockets but I I feel like it just makes it more fun yeah. like inventory management uh, is is just not 
generally a fun mechanic to play with, I don't think. I agree. It, it was it, um, part of the development of Half-Life 2, um, when Valve uh, originally played with the idea of um, G- Gordon Freeman only being able to carry one gun at a time, or a few guns at a time, because it's more <laughs> realistic. But then they realized that it was just shit. Right. Um, so they chucked it out. And, I mean, yeah, that's just the way it should be, I think. I've seen games, I've seen RPG games where the, the inventory has been a grid. It's been like an Excel spreadsheet, and the items are all different sizes, and you have to arrange them in there. And you can actually, if you've got like a big long sword, you can rotate it and, oh, so that you can cram weird. everything into this grid. Yeah. And eventually, you know, you, you've you got too much stuff. And I just thought, how, how did someone design this as being part of the game? Mm. It's like, I've just found this amazing sword and now i've got to spend five minutes <laughs> shuffling things around in my in my backpack to, so that it fits well i think that's all we've got time for um does anyone have any last thoughts um there, there was one thing i wanted to do before we sign off sure i was hoping we could just have a moment of silence for tim schaefer's beard that's a really good point actually yeah, yeah. that's uh <laughs> thank you okay was that a, was that a, a, a long enough I have, I have no idea, okay. actually. <laughs> oh. I was I was afraid the Disney siren was going to go off then, but it didn't. We should. Is it is it worth pointing out that I read on Twitter today that Tim Schafer has uh, gallstones? Has he? Yeah. Oh, that's really bad. It, that, th- those are quite painful, aren't they? Yeah. I, if he has to pass them, then it may well mean that there is no double fine adventure. Oh dear. Because that's going to hurt. That's going to put him in a bad mood, guys. Well, um, <laughs> we we should have had a moment silence for his goldstones, but but the beard will have to do. Um, we wish uh, Tim Schafer a speedy recovery. We thank um, our listeners for listening. Lovely to have you listening, and please do get in touch with any thoughts or comments, interventions, and a big thank you to Paul Friends and our lovely guest. Thank you guys so much for having me. You're very welcome. And uh, we hope to have you again on the show some, at some point. Yeah. I, yeah. Oh, I'd, I'd love to be back anytime. And uh, that's it from us. So um, take care. God bless. Uh, not God bless. That was a, that was a bit religious. Um, Satan bless. And um, see you again sometime. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye, everyone.